Why are cities full of uncomfortable benches? This one has armrests to prevent you from sleeping. Here's another one, again with the arms, heavy metal. So what if I tell you they were designed to be uncomfortable? It's hostile, it's um, in the sense, yeah, just in the sense of makes someone um, uncomfortable. Referring to interventions in the built environment that are deliberately designed to discourage people from engaging in certain actions and activities. So the classic one is various devices or installations that are used to um, stop uh, especially homeless people from occupying certain areas in the city. Nowadays, cities are developed with close attention to details. So these benches have a purpose. They allow you to sit, but not get too comfortable. The goal is to limit the ways an object can be misused. Hostel architecture is a modern trend in urban design to modify or alter um, objects in order to discourage the misuse of these objects. And misuse is meant as a different use compared to what the designer had in mind at the beginning. Technology is being used to maintain order in the streets. Yeah, a kind of a camera equipped robot that the police could use to control and patrol and so on. And then I've seen that they have, some people have made proposals that, well, but it could also have information for homeless people who are living on the streets about where they could find showers or services and so on. I think, you know, that technology, uh, as they say, is often presented as something that's intended to be beneficial. It has a real potential on the other hand, or facial recognition, for example, that's how you could keep track of people living on the streets. It does have the potential though of being hostile in the sense of surveilling people um, or controlling them. For example, the, uh, the, the robot the police uh, officer might uh, uh, tell them, move on. It's a, a definite political move that's made against, against the homeless, you know, just to, um, largely to, um, uh, not, not to give them homes and not to shift them into shelter, but actually just to keep moving them on, you know, out of sight. It's mainly due to giving an image of quality. Often uh, homeless people are associated with um, low quality of the space and low quality of the city. So the main idea is, okay, if we don't let them sleep in inside the city, they have to move away so tourists or like the citizen that lives in the city can just leave the space without homeless, homeless people. Yeah. So it's a sort of um, this quality for a government. I think there are immediate reasons and then I think there are um, a kind of deeper cultural reasons. So the, the, immediate, the immediate reasons are that, um, that they have this particular vision of uh, what cities and urban spaces should look like in a global, world-leading city and um, that uh, anything that they can do to control that image is something that they will do. Um, I think the deeper reasons are that there is really like a failure to um, address and confront the sort of broader systemic underlying issues that drive homelessness. It doesn't resonate with the image, the image that governments like to have of their place. You know? So when the New South Wales state government, for example, removed all of the homeless people from Martin Place, it was largely because they didn't want people seeing them, seeing them. so tourists seeing the homeless. They didn't want um, this image for the state itself. Um, uh, you know, all as, this, as a cruel state. You know? So it's easier for them to to shift people on or design, design, get designers to actually <laughs> work to shift people on. And it's not just in the benches or for the homeless. It's the knobs on these ledges made to discourage skateboarders. There's also like, for example, stairs 
the, uh, the same kind of uh, I, um, concept, so this grudge laying down. Or it could be also on walls, for example, where they try to be scratched, climb on walls. So all these kind of small um, features that you can change in objects. Well, I mean, this is a question of a little bit of what we want in the public spaces. And of course, it's understandable that you might not want to birds in certain places. Uh, I mean, that's part of a larger issue about, you know, how in an urban environment, where I suppose we relate to, to still the fact that there are, there are birds and, and animals living there. But I think that, I mean, take the skateboarders. Um, there, it's true, I think there's one vision of an urban space that's all very sort of sanitized, Disney-like, controlled. There's never an unpleasant experience. There's never mm -hmm. any rowdiness and so on. And, um, well, like I say, I, mean, I say it's sanitized. I think that's also a little bit sterile, but I think, you know, uh, technology can make a difference there, right? You make, you make it... In general, you try to make it, you try to conform the architecture to some sense of what you want people to do and not to. It can make it into a very controlled environment. It's sort of hostile to the spontaneity, to the mixing of experiences, to the unexpected. And <clears throat> whereas a more sort of traditional public spaces allow for more interactions, I mean, there can be street performers, I mean, you know, so that there can be, you just, yeah, maybe somebody is skateboarding and so on. Um, uh, but part of it is, what do we want in urban spaces? How controlled do we want it to be? But the very architecture of it, um, yeah, can matter. I mean, the same way that a gated community, the architecture of the fence and the entrances is an attempt to create a controlled environment. It's the spikes you see on columns, store signs, on the churches, all of those are meant to deter birds in a hostile way. It's the barriers on the street designed to prevent attacks. You can also think about um, extractive landscapes and layers of style architecture. Public toilets, for example, start being designed to be um, impenetrable and easily locked up and closed up. Technology is used in a hostile way to keep people on the move. There's a machine called the Mosquito that makes an unbearable sound for the ears. Also, technology prevents drug users from consuming in public restrooms with the use of blue lights. This prevents users from consuming drugs since they cannot see their veins with this type of light. In my mind, you know, the alternative anyway, I think, I think this would be better to be invest in adequate access to you know, drug treatment programs if, as opposed to uh, the blue lights. But, you know, right. if we had a society that had truly adequate access, I think most people would take advantage of it. There's many more people who would accept it if they could get it than there are people who just like, no, I won't take it even though it's available. In that context of a more caring society, I mean, would you want as a backup the kind of the blue light that if you thought, well, that medication may happen, that possibly. I mean, it's really the context in which the technology is used is it is it a substitute or a band-aid you know really addressing some major problem that we have or you know is it as i say in the context where it's just a little backup but we're really mostly dealing say with drug abuse problems by trying to make get people in treatment and, and make it available to them hostel architecture deals with homelessness in the sense of trying to make them invisible and in the way you do that is you keep them in the move. You disperse them so that they are large incumbents and then you pretend they are not there to the extent it must be their problem. Broken people that were responsible or they just need to be forced into shelter. That whole image I think is incorrect, but that is kind of what hostel architecture takes for granted. So is hostel architecture the correct solution for homelessness and street misconduct? Thank you all for watching.